In this video, we'll be taking a whistle-stop tour of some of the interesting conversations you can tune into, assuming you know the basics of sonata form. Say you've learned about how the main theme begins in the tonic, and how the transition leads to the subordinate theme, which sounds in the subordinate key area, and you know that all of this is called the exposition. You're aware also that the development section takes us through a whirlwind of foreign key areas and hashes out the exposition's themes along the way before landing us on the dominant. And finally, say you know about how the recapitulation brings back all of these themes in the tonic key, including the subordinate theme. Assuming this wasn't all just gibberish to you, is there anything else you need to know about sonata form? Fear not, it's not so much that there is more to worry about, but rather, now that you've so diligently mastered the rules of sonata form, you've earned yourself access to a whole bunch of cool things to think about, including debunking the 18th century sonata form, the sonata principle, the emergence of the musical work, and the Hegelian dialectic in sonata theory. First things first, there's no such thing as the 18th century sonata form. Sonatas in this period come in all sorts of different guises that simply don't fit in the textbook model we all know so well. The argument for a diversified understanding of sonata form was championed by Charles Rosen, who argued that one cannot define sonata form to accurately reflect 18th century works for even a decade. He shows how sonata form in the classical period is really a potpourri of diverse compositional strategies and experiments. For example, some sonatas in the classical period bring back the main theme in the tonic key right at the beginning of the development section. Rosen believes that this practice of writing in a premature reprise responded to the 18th century penchant for symmetrical forms, but it completely undercuts the drama and tension we've come to expect of a development section. On the other hand, some sonatas leave out the first phrase of the main theme when it's recapitulated. This means that the memorable beginning of the melody, which so often helps us gather our bearings at the beginning of a recapitulation, is no longer there to aid our orientation in the form. Haydn's string quartet in E-flat major, opus 50 number 3, is a great example of this. Here's the main theme. Listen to how it consists of two phrases, the first with a jocular, sprightly head motif, and the second phrase with an eighth note arpeggio motif. Now listen to the way the recap begins. I'll start at the end of the development section. Notice how it starts with a false recapitulation in the subdominant key, and it's missing the head motif. When we get the real recapitulation in the right key, it's still missing the head motif. Because of these compositional decisions, it's pretty hard to tell where the real recapitulation has begun. Rosen therefore argues that we should think of sonata form in the 18th century as consisting of useful stereotypes that could be employed or abandoned at will. In fact, it wasn't until the 19th century that a unified idea of sonata form emerged, and that the term sonata form was even invented. Nevertheless, in another area of discussion, we come across the sonata principle, as it's been called, which is an attempt to unify sonatas under a common light. While there are exceptions to the sonata principle, we're already fairly familiar with its basic tenet, which is that thematically significant parts of the sonata which sound in non-tonic keys should return in the tonic. This is a critical construct for many reasons. First, built on this tension between the tonic and non-tonic keys are some important narrative tropes, such as the epic journey and the hero's return home, which has held a significant place in the Western sensibility as early as the Homerian epic Iliad. These narratives aggrandize the journey towards the goal 
and dramatize the attainment of the goal itself. The attainment of the goal, and consequently the attainment of closure of the work as a whole, gained newfound importance through sonata form. It's fascinating, therefore, that sonata form was historically codified around the same time that the concept of the musical work emerged. Is this a coincidence? Could sonata form's dramatization of conflict and resolution have instilled the music with a new sense of internal coherence, demanding the conception of a self-sufficient work? While we can't say for sure, this is a provocative idea that is worth exploring further. It's fair to say that out of all sonata composers, no single one had more influence in establishing the concept of the musical work as a privileged entity as Beethoven. Among the innovations that Beethoven brought to the sonata form tradition, he greatly expanded the length and expressive scope of the development, which in turn makes the onset of the recapitulation and the triumphant attainment of the home key all the more momentous. <laughs> These dramatized gestures of conflict finally being resolved act as structural markers that the end of the work is nigh. The harmonic progressions Beethoven uses are also notable for how they amplify the effect of internal closure of the tonal trajectory. Listen to how Beethoven stretches out each cadential harmony into an entity of its own. <laughs> He really revs up the momentum of the cadence. For some contrast, listen to Haydn's treatment of the cadence. In comparison to this excerpt of Haydn, the Beethoven example created a much more assertive cadential gesture, in part through its lengthening of the dominant function. This feeds into a sense of internal boundedness and the self-sufficiency of the musical work. Another way the tonal tension fundamental to sonata form has been thought about is through the lens of Hegelian dialectic philosophy. In Hegel, we have a starting point, the thesis, that becomes defined against a contrasting entity, the antithesis. Instead of letting these entities sit as opposites, Hegel theorizes that elements of each can be combined to form a synthesis, allowing the whole system to be raised up to another level. When reading this philosophy into sonata form, the presentation of the home key and the subordinate key act as the thesis and antithesis, respectively, that become synthesized in a Hegelian dialectic. Under this framework, we have the main theme representing the self, the subordinate theme representing the departure from the self, and the recap representing the reconciliation of self and other through the tonal unification of both themes. For Adorno, the recapitulation is given heightened philosophical power through the Beethovenian development, which is a place where themes from the exposition are given over to a foreign environment of contrasting keys and motivic elements. Adorno singles out the moment in developments where an expositional theme breaks through decisively with a bold forte dynamic, calling it the intervention of the self. To give you an example of what that moment sounds like, let's listen to an excerpt of the development of the Appassionata Sonata. You'll hear that after some wandering, we come out of the woods with a dramatic entry of the main theme that is then sequenced. To bring this excerpt back into the Hegelian framework, we can now appreciate Rose Sabotnik's claim that the development section features the recognition of the self in the other. Hegelian thought also has other ramifications tied up in the genre of sonata. In the Hegelian dialectic, there's a kind of inevitability of logical consequence. The thesis and antithesis must reach synthesis. 
This synthesis becomes another thesis that then finds an opposition in an antithesis of its own and folds into a synthesis at yet a higher level. This deterministic philosophy can continue on to preside over all levels, and it creates a organicist rhetoric of natural succession which finds itself quite at home in discussions about sonatas. For the theorist A.B. Marx, the construction of Beethoven's sonatas adhere to an inherent logic, whereby it's the opposition between motion and rest that breathes life into a piece of music and spurs on its unfolding. For instance, Marx shows how the beginning of Beethoven's piano sonata in F minor, opus 2, suggests a balanced and tonally stable period form consisting of an antecedent and consequent. However, Beethoven then allows the consequent phrase to open up into a transitionary phrase, which counteracts the stability of the period. For Marx, this is how Beethoven injects a driving impulse that balances out the stagnation and predictability of the period. Let's take a listen. Marx argues that a driving impulse such as what we heard must always be there to balance out any stagnation in sonata forms. If not, the character of the sonata form will be compromised. Another form should have been chosen. Alright, that's all for now. This doesn't exhaust all there is to ponder about when it comes to sonata forms, but I hope it gives you some idea of the range of theoretical questions you can engage with along the way of performing and learning about sonata forms. For the sources this video drew on, please refer to the video description. Thanks for watching.